to episode 45 of Pauscast. It's June 29th, 2017. I'm Jessica Alouette, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Mark Hanna, I use he, him. Welcome! Hey, Mark. Hey. Um, we had some technical difficulties getting everything set up, but now everything's good. Uh, how have you been this week? Pretty good, pretty busy, still no laptop. Ah, oh, um, <laughs> this ongoing thing. I'm really hoping I get it back tomorrow, but oh, it's been such a pain. Imagine. Yeah, so I'll give you the, the brief. Um, my phone sometimes doesn't get text messages. It's wonderful. So um, I called them a while back to say, hey, just making sure you've got my email and you're going to email me instead of trying to text me. Cool. And then, of course, they texted me their estimate, their quote, which I have to approve before they do it. I didn't know, because I didn't get it. So I called them and said, hey, I haven't heard from you. And they said, oh, we texted you. So I said, okay, can you email me instead and also go ahead? And now I think if it's ready, they've probably texted me. Uh, so I'm going to have to call them tomorrow and be like, hey, can I pick it up or not? Yeah. And if it's not ready tomorrow, that means I won't have it in time for the D&D session I'm running on Saturday. So I really hope I get it by tomorrow. If not, it'll be next week. Like, I had better have this back by next Thursday, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it, oh, it feels like it's been forever um, since I had it. So I've been stuck um, stuck with my desktop still. And it's been kind of cold. Yeah. So I'm, I've, I've <laughs> a few evenings this week I've come home and I've turned on the head next to my bed and just sort of huddled near it instead of using, <laughs> instead of playing anything. But no, I've, I've been good all up. Have, how have you been? Good. Um, you want to get right into you want to get right into things? Yeah, yeah. All right, what have you been playing this week? Um, so I've I've only I've barely played any Andromeda multiplayer, which is the main thing I've been playing lately. While I wait for my laptop to come back, um, but since we discussed Shadow of Mordor a little bit in the last episode, I I got to thinking about um different combat systems in games like. When I jumped back into Shadow of Mordor, because you know, I've played like 60 hours of that game or something, the combat had started to feel um, repetitive and a bit one-dimensional, just mainly, I think, because of my familiarity with it. Um, so I was thinking, okay, what games offer more variety with that? And there are some like, um, what's it called, Mount and Blade, which are really neat, but also I just wasn't really in the mood for. Um, I got to think of the Prince of Persia games, which have had really interesting combat. The, and Sands of Time... Didn't have nearly as much, but the next one, Warrior Within, which is the first one I played, opened it up quite a lot. And I mean, this is a 13-year-old game, but it was installed already on my desktop, so I thought, oh, okay, I may as well open it up. I think I got a bundle of them at some point, because I definitely played that game before I had Steam, it was 2004. Um, right. And so both, it's been really fun, and wow, I'd forgotten about some things in this game. Um, <laughs> There are essentially three characters. There's the prince who you play, and there's two women who haven't been named yet um, in the f two or three hours I've been playing that are both vest uh, dressed incredibly scantily, one of them barely at all. When she's introduced, it's the you know 2004 high-quality FMV um, of her walking up the stairs from behind, except there's essentially nothing at all covering her ass or her legs. <laughs> Um, so that's what the camera's focused on, of course. Sounds like a video game ass um, video game. Oh, I know, right? But, you know, the combat is fun, so I'm enjoying that aspect of it, um, <laughs> at least. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of nostalgia since I played this game 13 years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really good in how, um, you can interact with the environment and, and there's a lot of movement around, like jumping over and jumping off enemies instead of just like the vault you've got in shadow of mortar for example um you can jump over and then jump away from enemies i think you can jump on and then away so in the opposite direction you can jump over then throw them there's a lot of movement based combos which is really nice right. i haven't seen those as much in other games so the i'm comparing it with shadow of mortar because it's the most recent other yeah, one yeah. based based on melee combat but it's the same kind of thing as the arkham games where the movement was essentially, oh, you're attacking in that direction? Okay, I'll do some cool moving thing, but just it's just moving yeah, in that direction and then attack. Arkham right? really, really went all out on just moving you across the arenas yeah. that it had set up. 
it was and i mean that's cool but it's 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 just moving in a straight line yeah. in the direction you're going to hit something um whereas this you are like there's an enemy in front of me and two behind me and i can jump onto the enemy in front of me and then off them over an enemy behind me to do an attack as i land kind of stuff it's pretty neat right um i'm enjoying it and they've introduced a bunch of um different enemy types which i have found more interesting than the variety from shadow of mordor but i mean i think i mentioned last week i'm looking forward to new enemy types in shadow of war they showed them off a bit in at e3 that there were going to be some more enemy types that you fight differently right um but i'm getting i'm sort of scratching that itch a little bit by playing this game i think but that's the main thing i've been playing this week what about you I got into something that was a little unexpected and something that's been sitting in my library for a little while as well. Um, I'll yeah. talk about the thing that's been sitting in my library for a little while first. Okay. Um, I have had a copy of Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch, just kind of sitting here next to me for a while. And mm-hmm. just uh, the other day, finally started to actually put that copy to good use and start playing it. And it's kind of, it's kind of wild. Um, so you've, you've told me about this game before, haven't you? Is it the one that was animated by, what's it called? By Studio right Ghibli. Game? Yes. Yes. Is that, that, that's the game, it's right? The, this is the game that was animated by Studio right. Ghibli. Yeah. You, I think you mentioned it to me that a week or two ago. Yeah. I, I, have been so surprised by this game. Um, it has like all of the Ghibli charm, just like all over it and not just in the like Ghibli animated cinematics. It's everywhere in the, um, in the game. It is just fucking beautiful. Nice. Um, it's got a score from the composer who also worked on princess Mononoke and, Mm -hmm. uh, like a handful of other Ghibli films uh, it's got a really cool kind of combat system as well. Um, it relies on what's called familiars, uh, which you get over the course of the game. You can kind of capture familiars. So it's got like this, it's got Pokemon, but in real time kind of combat going on, which is interesting. Okay. Um, so it's a real time based combat system then. Yeah, there is a real-time based combat system where you like move around and you can issue commands uh and then your creature will go off and do them and then you can issue another set of commands, but it happens all in real time. Okay. Uh cuz you you can also like interrupt commands at any given time and just say, "Oh, do this thing instead." Quick. So if you see mm-hmm. an enemy going for a big move, uh you can actually quickly just swap off to defense. Um, yeah. Right. The overworld feels a little bit like um, old Final Fantasy games, so stuff like Final Fantasy three um, feels very kind of classic Japanese RPG. Oh. When you say Final Fantasy three, that's the one that was released in the US as three, but in Japan was six. Yes. Or the actual Final Fantasy three. Um, Terra. Uh, I don't know, honestly. I I have like the fuzziest memories of Final Fantasy three, so I'm gonna. You start that. when you start in like magical armor, and there's someone with like sorry, um, like magical mechanical armor, and there's a girl with green hair. No, it, I think it might be the American no. Final Fantasy three. No, because that is the American Final Fantasy three that I'm describing. Oh, what the hell? Maybe. Um, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough about Final Fantasy to give you a concrete answer. Okay. Because you should play Final. This you should play that Final Fantasy. It's very good. But I'm getting distracted. <laughs> I'm well. I'm distracting you. Yeah. No. Um, was it Final Fantasy six in? Apparently, it was Final Fantasy six in Australia and New Zealand, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, but in the states, it was it was three. I'm pretty sure it was six. Yeah, I, I only played it um, through an emulator so, later on. Okay. Uh, the queerest deer is advising me of this through the um, through the chat. Um, yeah, shit. <laughs> this Nino Kuni is very good. I have really enjoyed the like five or so hours that I've put into it. Uh, it made me feel things right in like the first half an hour. It's got nice. Yeah, it's. I'm excited to dip into more of this game. It's really, really exciting. 
So does it feel much like a movie? It, I think at times it does. Other times, not so much. Like, especially once we start getting into the, like, start getting into all the systems and... Yep. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I don't stuff. mean in terms of watching it instead of interacting with it. I mean, like, um, just the feeling you get when yeah, you're consuming you know it as it, media. Do you get that similar sort of feeling? I get the similar sort of feeling that I get watching a Ghibli film. It feels very true to that experience. and That's really cool. It, it's it's really special that they've captured that actually, so yeah. I'm I'm thrilled with this, and nice. I I definitely look forward to spending more time in this like really charming world. Now, is, am I remembering right? Was this one of the games that got a sequel announced? Yes, in, at E3, and that's actually kind of part of the reason I am looking to play it because Nino Kuni right. two, um, with the subtitle Revenant Kingdom is coming out mm-hmm. uh, in November, I want to say. So oh, this year, cool. in order in order to get myself ready for that, I actually have decided I want to sit down and I want to sit down and actually play Nino Kuni and see what makes it so mm-hmm. awesome and I I'm I'm fully in. I'm 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 nice. out of here for it. So you mentioned it's got an overworld. Is it is it fairly open sort of thing or Yeah, uh, it's it's is a it, really yeah? open overworld. Uh, there's only I've only run into a set of like actual areas within the overworld, mm-hmm. but um, there's definitely a lot of creatures uh, out and about. There's no random encounters, so if if an enemy sees you, it'll come running towards you. Uh, if you get hit by from behind, you won't be able to act for the first kind of ten fifteen seconds of the battle. So you just kind of have to. It sounds really similar to how my flatmate has described Persona 5's I think, um, entering combat. Yeah, system. I think that's a little bit how it works. It's just Persona 5 happens in uh, turn based. And then this. Yeah, happens, once you're in combat. Yeah, yeah, this actually happens in real time. So you, could, you can very easily evade all the attacks if you get caught at the disadvantage. But that system works in your favor as well because you can also kind of act and. Um, if you get someone behind, if you get behind an enemy that you've walked up on, then you are going to uh, have the advantage coming into the round, and they will have ten seconds in which they can act. Right. Um. How does it do? Have you found on that um thing we've talked about before with the side content to main content kind of ratio? You know how there are games where you can get really lost in the side content and lose momentum, or ones that don't have much and you have to mainline it? How does it do in terms of that? There is, from what I gather, there's a substantial amount of side content in Nino Kuni. Um, it's framed as like errands, so there's no real like urgency to do them, and the rewards for doing them are pretty minor as well. It actually, it's mm-hmm. got a cool system for handling that as well. Um. You get what are called merit cards, um, which each quest is worth a certain amount of merit cards. So you fill okay. up stamps on those cards. It's like 10 stamps to a card. And then you can mm-hmm. go redeem them at... And you get a free coffee. Pardon? And you get a free yeah, coffee. Yeah, you get a free coffee. No, you you can get stuff like... Oh, this this will let you move just a little bit faster in the overworld. This will make you... This will oh, let right. you jump. There's no real reason to jump, but you could do it anyway. It's fun. Oh, well, I wonder if there are um, if there's some content you can only access once you've got a certain number of upgrades or something. I don't know Speaking that there is honestly. Like no? all of this is okay. definitely, definitely not mandatory. You could quite easily mm-hmm. go through the game without doing it, and you don't get any experience for doing it either. You just get those merit cards. So there's no like is it ex- grinding for side content. Is it experience-based progression at all? Like, does your character get stronger? Yes, there is an experience-based progression, uh, but it's only only for combat stuff. It's not at all for any of the side oh, okay. content or quest content that you're doing. It's just combat. So are they are they separated out or something? How do you mean? Sorry, how do you mean? Like, um, if you haven't leveled up a lot in the combat, does that lock away? 
the any you know, some of the narrative stuff because you can't get past the combat, or can they are they independent in some of the side stuff? I think it's independent enough at this stage, but I'm still in very early game, okay. so maybe I can come back to that oh, yeah. a little later. Because right now I, I'm I'm not fully sure how well that's going to play. That's right. The question wasn't super well phrased anyway. <laughs> think about it. Maybe we can come back to it next week because I'm I'm definitely putting more time into Nino Kuni. Nice. Uh, the other thing that I've been putting mm. some time into this week, and this was, it was unexpected for me to be able to do this, and I have talked about hmm, I'm nervous about this game before. Uh, it's Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Oh, you actually played it now. I have actually played it for about eight hours since getting it a couple days ago. Oh, wow. Ago. Um, you like it then? Oh, oh. I like this game a lot more than I was expecting. I've been watching okay. all of the um, like Waypoint team and Polygon team play in this game, and I, was, I, w- I thought hmm, that might be as far as I want to go, but no, I'm in it. Um... I got my I got a win on my first night. I was with um Wait, a handful of people you... from the Waypoint um Discord server and we all were playing together. We ended up getting first mm-hmm. place on my first night. We got second Oh, is it team based? Uh there's okay, so there's there yeah. is a solo mode where you can like it's you versus ninety nine other people. There's a t- Yeah, that's all that's what I thought the whole thing no, was. No, there's also a duo and squad mode. So right. um, you get ranked as well based on your performance in each of those modes independently. So you'll have mm. like a solo ranking and a duo ranking and a squad ranking. Squads can be yeah. either three or four, and you'll only be matched against other squads of the same size. Right. But uh, we, ha- we, had a full, we had a full squad of four, and we managed to get uh, first place uh, after nice. like, I think, three or four rounds. That was it. Was intense. This game, it's, so, it's it is really intense in ways I don't think I was fully prepared for, and I I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's got fantastic sound design. It's like the sound is so important in this game because can you describe again to me the format of the of the matches because it's you get dropped in an arena, right? You get dropped onto but like you a don't just it, big open island. Okay, because you're not then, just immediately going up to bash your other players or anything. You have to prepare, and then it closes in on you or something? Yeah, so everybody gets dropped in at the same time. Uh, you, mm-hmm. There's a plane that flies over the island, and you have to eject and drop onto it. Um, so you can navigate a little bit while you're in the air, get yourself into okay. a good position, and then go find, go find a building to loot, get yourself equipped. And uh, after about a minute... After everybody's dropped, you get uh, the first circle, which is the actual um, play area that the game has defined for this round. And so you, okay. then you have to make your way towards that circle. Uh, after a certain amount of time, you get a big wall of electricity that's going to start closing in on you. Um, so you'll take a little bit of damage over time, um, every time that you, every, for every little bit that you're outside of the play area. And it's constantly kind of closing in. Um, so once it reaches the circle that was defined, then it'll give you another circle. And it can be anywhere within that existing one. It's not always just going to be right in the center. It could be off to the right. like west, east, etc. And mm-hmm. then it's, a, it's just a smaller play area, and everybody's got to make their way towards that. So it's... So you can't just hide forever. Yeah, exactly. You you're being driven to move. If you get really lucky, you can like kind of hide forever if you really wanted to. But other otherwise, you're going to be driven to move. There's going to be like people rushing by you in vehicles trying to get to the circle so they can stay alive, and it creates these like really nerve wracking situations. And if you die, that's it, right? You're out for the that's round. That's it. You're out for the round, but you can you don't have to stay around until the round ends because you can't actually see anything from that point. You just... Oh, you don't get a spectator nope. mode. No spectator mode. Oh, you can do it in custom games, but okay. I think there like there's a good reason. It's because like if you're hanging out with other friends and you happen to be in the same match, you can or, tell them, "Oh, like, this one behind you." People who are in streams might come by. Yeah. Um. Might be getting. A, 
they might uh, what's called stream snipe, which is like watch someone else's stream and then get their location and then come after them. It's it's bizarre and common more so in like survival games like Rust, Ark survival. I suppose evolved. yeah. The main thing I have to compare it to is the only online game I've been playing lately, Andromeda, which is no, there's no competitive aspect to it. It's you, you're, you the team versus yeah. the enemies. No, and there is a spectator mode is... in that, but like, there's no downside to it. Yes, I tell my flatmate if something's coming up behind him, but like, uh, no yeah, one's exactly. getting killed because of that. Not you even can, figuratively. You can spectate your teammates if you are, um, if you're part of a squad or a duo. Okay. So, but it's restricted to exactly what they see. So you could certainly right. you could this certainly kind of call out movement. movement. So like, oh yeah, at yeah. bearing three thirty, I saw something move. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. No, that, that's what I was thinking of by spectator mode was watching your teammates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that exists. Uh, if okay. you're playing solo, there's no spectator mode, and once the whole right. squad that makes is sense. down, then no spectator. Yeah. That game okay. is really good. I, I mentioned a little earlier as well that the sound design is just enormously important. If you can hear people off in the distance, off to like you can you can kind of use gunfire in the distance as oh there's people about like two hundred meters away. I should dip over to the left. I should uh, maybe or like use this bridge as cover because like people are near. Got to make sure. So what the way the the sound volume and sort of the, the f- shape of it, I yeah, guess, exactly. changes over distance is enough that you can actually use it like yeah, that. Yeah, you can totally use that positionally. Uh, nice. You can be disadvantaged by it, too, because if you come into a house and the door is closed, mm-hmm. you've got to open that door. That makes a lot of noise when you open that door. So if anybody's in that house with you, they know you're there now. Uh and vice versa. You can you can use that to your advantage. You can use footsteps. Like you can hear people coming. What's the UI like? Is it quite minimal? It's or? extremely minimal. There's a map in the um, bottom right, which will show you, uh, kind of just your surroundings. It'll show you what buildings are in the area, uh, where your are. I like how you are. you go straight from the UI is very minimal. They have the most distracting part of a UI you can have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess. Anyway, sorry. But it's it's, it's okay. ultimately not all that important to the game, is the thing about the minimap, okay. so I guess I just ignore it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other part of the UI is just there's a health bar and uh, your ammo count right above it, and that's kind of it. So you don't see player names or anything like that? Nope. Uh, you do, oh, you do see how many people are alive. That's in the top, uh, top right. That's kind of okay. That's 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 the whole UI. I just described all of it. Cool. Um, or the whole whole HUD rather. There's like a, yeah. an inventory yeah, yeah, yeah. system going on. Sure There's uh, a little bit more detail that goes into the map. You can like place waymarks and like so you can say, oh yeah, I want to go here. This complex has treated me well in the past, so I'll just I'll go over here and I'll get some more loot. Um, so the pre-existing maps, they're always the it's same. It's always the same map at the moment. Um, oh, just one. Yeah, it's just the one huge, huge island. Um, it's eight eight by eight kilometers is the total space of that. It's it's massive. Point, wait, wait, sorry, is that eight point square kilometers? No, like eight kilometers, um, one direction, eight kilo- or one axis, eight kilometers. The oh, okay. Other axis. Eight, it's eight by yeah, eight, right? Eight okay, eight. yeah, cool. So it's it's proper huge. Um, that would be sixty four square kilometers, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's math. I can do math. <laughs> it 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 is, it is super big. It is a really really intricate game with a lot of cool systems and I thoroughly am loving Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. It's very good. Nice. Is it not it's not stressful? Because I remember when you described it to me, I thought that game sounds really stressful to me. It It's not super stressful, but it is tense. 
Okay. I, I think I, I think that is how I would describe it. You have to be aware, and as long as you are aware of like what's going on around you, I don't think you, you're going to find yourself too stressed. You gotta. You have I to might, remain aware. But you're not. <laughs> you can find yourself in really, really tense situations. Like, oh, there, there like, is so- gunfire meters away from me. There is someone right near me. And if that happens, like, how quickly can you die? You can die pretty quickly. Um, it only takes a handful of shots to take you down, as long as you don't have like, if you haven't found armor or if you haven't found a helmet. Uh, you can go down pretty quickly. If you've got armor or helmet, you're going to last a little bit longer. There's healing items that you can find in the world. There's items mm-hmm. like energy drinks, which will let you move a little faster as well. And these items, are they always in the same place No, too? they are not. All the item okay. spawns are totally randomized. Oh, I was thinking there has to be some element of that, because otherwise it would just be the more you play, the better you know where everything is. Yeah, uh, I mean, you up. can have... you can. You can have the experience of, oh yeah, I have gone to this place a bunch of times, and it's had good loot mm. each time, but the loot is always going to be different. Yeah. Mm. And you could eventually be betrayed by that as well. You never know. Anyway, that's that's Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. I, I'm extremely nice. liking that game. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Because yeah, it's been at like, the top of Steam's bestsellers for weeks now. Yeah, it's, there's a good reason for it, as it turns out. <laughs> I suppose as well. So the the matches are huge. You were saying ninety nine people, but I suppose if a lot of people are playing it, do you, you not have to wait very long for a match? You then? absolutely do not have to wait very long for a match. Um, I'm going to boot up the stats page real quick. Okay. Um. So Battlegrounds currently has twenty six thousand people playing it. Uh. So audience is certainly not an issue. Um. Mm. Peak today was two hundred and thirty seven thousand people. Which is wow! That'll be when it's daytime, or when it's peak playtime, and you know more populous countries. Yeah, exactly. So, um, like that actually puts it in the top three uh, for games on Steam with um, overall player count. The only two games that it that are beating Player Unknown's Battlegrounds right now for just sheer amount of audience in a day. Is Dota... I'm guessing one is going to be a MOBA and one is going to be Counter-Strike? Yeah, actually, that's exactly it. Dota 2 with over 700,000 players at peak and uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive with about 500,000 at uh, the peak. Yeah. Like this, ga- if this game has some audience. It sold like a... How have you... It sold almost 2 million copies, I think. Oh, well, wow. How have you found... Um... Like your ping, like uh, is there a decent sized audience nearby enough? Oh or yeah, does the for game sure. Just run well enough. Um, there's a decent sized audience here, and like it's still perfectly playable on the North American servers, even. Yeah, that's good. that's good then, because that can be a you know that's it like one of the big things about playing online because, in New Zealand. Yeah, we live on an island. It's bad as it turns out sometimes for the internet, but there is an Oceana server. Uh, it's been populous when I've played on it, but. I've mostly just played on North America, and it's been oh, fine. I was pleasantly okay. surprised by how like playable it was, even on NA. So and that's good, though. Oh, it's super yeah. good. It means that like I have access to all my friends. I could play mm. with people in the Waypoint um, crew, like I did uh, with my first matches. So you spe- you pick which server you're gonna. Oh play yeah, on, you right? you pick before okay. um, before you get matched in. You can pick. Oh yeah, I want to play on North America or Europe or Oceania, Asia. And I think there's a Middle East server. I think that's the the last one that rounds it out. Yeah. <sighs> Battlegrounds is really fucking good. I'm st- I'm stoked to be able to play more of that and come back to it. Nice. Turns out I just really like competitive multiplayer. <laughs> You're like my opposite. I know, but that's what that's what <laughs> that's what makes this interesting. What makes this interesting is I can I can talk about all the cool competitive multiplayer stuff I'm doing, like, and I can continue to be afraid of it. You well, you get to talk about way more cool single player stuff as a result because you're not spending any time well, doing 
competitive what? multiplayer. You're just all in. When on... I've got a when I've got a computer that will play. <laughs> 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 like is that? I mean, yeah, there's that too. Actually, I spotted. Um, we talked about it last year that Diablo three was going to have a new character class. I think that's finally dropped now. Uh, I might have to try that at some point. Oh yeah, Diablo three got the Necromancer now, huh? Yeah, it's it's not free DLC, but I don't know how much it costs. But yeah, I might because you know I periodically I think it's, gone um, back into 15 that. Fifteen so. dollars, uh, US. I mean, that's not that bad. It's not. Well, I say that's not that bad, but I've also avoided spending anything on the Steam sale, even though everything's really cheap. <laughs> get, um, do you have Wolfenstein the New Order? I think you do, don't you? Probably not. I don't tend to buy shooters. Missing out. That's a that's a really good game. You've told me that. How much is it at the moment? Ten dollars. Yeah. Um, it it's very violent though. As I think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think I think yeah. I have had this discussion with you. It's it's that I, it's yeah. Wolfenstein is very good, so. but it is ultra violent. Um. It's right. like it is. It is doom levels of ultraviolence. It is quite. Right. It's quite brutal. It's very good. Though. Okay. <laughs> it's a good story. I like. I, I've been thinking about how good Wolfenstein's story actually is recently. God damn, that game is a good story. I think I mentioned last week um, that watching the. E3 trailer for the next Wolfenstein game, which is very cinematic rather than gameplay. Yes. Gave me there was one scene in particular that gave me a similar feel to watching Inglorious Bastards, that infamous scene at the very start of mm. it. And that was pretty cool just to get that same feeling yeah, for it because that's There's actually another scene, scene like that in uh, uh the first game in which oh, yeah? um you're essentially confronted with one of the big bads just kind of on a train in a and she stops you and asks you to just put your coffee that you've got down on the table. She sits you down and she says, we're going to play a little game. It's determined to, it's so that we can determine if you have impure blood running through your veins. And you're sitting, Uh-oh. you're sitting across from this <laughs> Nazi and you are, yeah. the, your character, BJ Blazkowicz. So this is, is presumably a, this is, this is he's a Jewish at a man. point where you, where you're not just going to pull out your gun. Right. No, this is not a point where you're just going to pull out okay. your gun. Um, right. She's got a gun to your head, in fact. And you're going to play this game. She takes out a pair of photos. She asks you, choose, choose the photo that excites you the most, if you know what I mean. So you pick a photo. And then she puts you out another set. Choose the photo that is the most beautiful. So you choose a photo. Fine, and then she uh, puts out another set. Choose the, f- choose the photo that makes you feel disgusted. And as you reach to choose for that photo, she grabs your hand. She says, I should have warned you. This is the final test. Choose wisely. And then it resets your decision. You can choose that card again. All, all this time, you're sitting across from one of the big bads. You've run into her mm. before. She's not, she's not figured out who you are, but you've run into her. And it's this really, really tense moment. And it's executed so well, and it's very reminiscent of Inglorious Bastards. Mm. Wolfenstein the New Order is like, it's super tense, it's super pulpy, but it really works. How do you mean pulpy? Um, it's, it feels like a Tarantino film. Hmm. Basically, uh, right. basically the gist. Uh, it feels like, it feels like Inglorious Bastards, it feels like a little bit of Pulp Fiction, um, probably a little bit of, mm, mm. Nah. A little bit of Pulp Fiction, a little bit of Inglorious Bastards. Okay. But it, it does manage to create these really, really tense moments in the game. And Wolfenstein the New Order is a very good video game. <sighs> that, that, yeah, okay. <laughs> when are the creeps thinking about that scene? They haven't even played through it. Yeah, no, I, I, I could show <laughs> you it. 
You also have the option. You do have the option to just pick up the gun because it's on the table. Okay. Um, but that will result in your immediate death from a very large robot who is kind of guarding over this situation. Right. And so you, you do the you same thing again, it. but don't pick up the gun? It's an option, but you will die instantly. You have to... I kind of want to ask what happens next, but I feel like we're going to go down a rabbit hole. I'll just keep asking you, so what happens next? <laughs> so what happens next? What I mean, I can, next? I can tell you. Um, <laughs> I, I can make this quick. It was... She was fucking with you. The, the test meant nothing. It's, it was hmm. all bullshit. Um... She was just doing it to fuck with you. And then you leave. Okay. Because there's no clear right answer that she's looking for. Yeah, there's for. no clear right answer that she's looking for. She's just actively fucking with you. Right. Just for her own amusement. Um, you run into her a little bit later. There's a, there's a scene in which you enter a uh, labor camp to break out one of the other protagonists. Um, and so you run into her again there, and that is also, it's very, very intense. Mm -hmm. oh. You just reminded me of something that, that, that bugs me occasionally in games, though, which is when you spend the whole game with lots of people aiming guns at you and shooting at you, and you're just fine, you'll hide behind something and shoot back. But then once a cutscene starts and someone aims a gun at you, you have to drop your gun. It's like, I've been shot 1,500 times. You just aim a gun at me, I'm fine. Like, shoot me. <laughs> I don't care, I'll shoot you back. I don't, I don't think there's anything like that in Wolfenstein as well. Like, if there's, if there's a moment where you don't have a gun, it's just you don't have a gun to start with. You've never had a gun in that scene. You're not dropping it. Mm -hmm. But it's just it's the, the matter of, like, I'm pointing a gun at you in gameplay... It's not a real threat. It's a challenge and you can overcome it. Right. In a cutscene, I'm putting a gun at you. You have to do what I say because I'm putting a gun at you. Yeah. The, it's the, just stakes, that, are, that, the, that, the stakes are magically higher because you are in the context of a cinematic. Yeah, suddenly you're mortal again, unlike, unlike when the player is actually in charge. <sighs> it, it's, it's interesting as well because I, I think of that sometimes in the context of the D&D &D game I run. I think, well... Unlike uh, a video game, you know, I can't pull the players out and say, okay, we're doing a cutscene, so you can't do anything. You don't have all your powers and stuff. Right. So I can't, I can't do that magical raising the stakes. I need to, uh, if I'm going to do something like that where I want to keep their attention and not, I mean, <laughs> it's d, d I can never just say don't interrupt, really, because they have to be able to control their characters. But yeah, it can exactly. be harder to make that tension. What do you do to, like, deal with that tension in your d, &D? Um, like, is the solution just to create a massive, massive threat that would be a huge challenge for them to well, overcome, see, even if they were to I use their magical powers? Do you give... I don't tend to do that so much, because my, my campaign isn't a super combat-heavy campaign. Right. Um, I've tried before using the pressure of social norms to stop them drawing their weapons. That can actually work fairly well. Um, it can also backfire, but then they have to deal with the consequences. Hmm. Um, so it's not so much if you draw your sword, you are not get out of here alive so much as if you draw your sword, a lot of people are probably going to hate you. Yeah. That, I, I mean, that's thinking, its own pressure. I was just thinking of how you could execute on that. Like, Because as well, like in D&D, &D, if they die, you don't reload a save. And in, in no, my D&D &D world, I've gotten rid of resurrection because I don't want to cheapen death. So I don't want to ever have... Um, if you do this, you will instantly die because I don't really want the characters to die. And my players definitely don't either. And I don't want to make it not fun for them. So I, the stakes have to be, no, you'll lose something else. Something else bad will happen. It, it can be a hard thing to do because I don't want to, I don't want to have the stake, the, the consequence just be something that's not fun. You know, like if I took away their magic items or, or whatever, that just is making it less fun for them. Right. Yeah. So I need to think of something else that still has stakes, I still don't want it to happen, but if it does happen, it will um, not make it less fun, it'll add to the story and the drama, and they'll still enjoy that, that aspect of it. Um, I, I, think that, I think that the pressure of social norm 
would be a super good system for doing that. Like, it can be interesting though if you if you put them in a foreign place where the social norms are a bit different. It can be hard for different players to adjust to that sometimes as well. Hmm. That's a, that's a. Hmm. I imagine you could, especially you could when D D, where you can often get like ultra violent like, characters. You could probably do something interesting with like, oh, this this culture has like has this thing where you can challenge other people to duels, and if they accept, like, it's perfectly fine for you to be fighting in the streets. Exactly, right? You could do something like but that. But if you're in this other place and you try to do that, no one, no. Yeah, no, you, a... you, will be, you will be stopped somehow, some way. The, yeah. The uh, strong arm of the law will come down on you, throw you so in jail. So in the place, in the country they've been at for the last, oh, man, Honestly, like six months Oof. of game like, of game time, um, of sorry of of real time, not six yeah, months. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, but there's been a social norm where you don't the, magic isn't really accepted of a certain type, and it's the type they can use. So they they do meet some people who don't care about it, and that's cool. But if they're in public and they do something, people are going to notice. People aren't going to like it. Things might happen that? which they don't really hmm. want to happen. They'll draw attention. It's been interesting. They have to make a lot of stealth rolls whenever they want to do something. Like, one of them's a druid. He turns into animals. He doesn't want to do that in the street, because people will notice and think, holy shit, that's weird. What's Whereas wrong with that guy? Whereas if you can do it, like, just in the alley or something, you could, you exactly, could turn into Exactly, exactly, yeah. You could turn into an animal of some variety. Yeah, he does that all the time as well. He'll go, I'm going to go into an alley and turn into a bird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn into the uh, UAV bird from Assassin's Creed Origins. <laughs> hmm. That'll be my... Yeah, role. exactly. But I wonder, do, do games have things where in gameplay they use that sort of norms? Um, social norms or otherwise to stop combat. I know there are some things like, oh, you know, you're in this area so you can't pull out your weapon sort of thing. I remember Far Cry 2, I think you could aim... No. You would always be aiming down your gun, except if you went to a settlement where you were holding it and you weren't, and I think you couldn't aim or something. Mm. There's some games that force it like that. Are there any, though, where it's... The one I'm, one I'm thinking of right now, like the, the example mm. that came to mm-hmm. me immediately, was actually Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. There is okay. an area in that game, which is crucial to the main story, in fact, uh, where men are not allowed. You're not, al- you're not allowed into but... this town if you're a dude. But Link is a dude. It's, it leads right? into, like, oh, yeah, there's, like, someone who will sell you just, like, a traditional women's outfit, and you can go in that way because you will look indistinguishable because you have this outfit. It's pretty androgynous. Link is extremely androgynous. But, like, it's it's this social norm that prevents you from making progress because it's part but of can you... Erodo society. Can you go, can you just go in? No, they the will rules uh, and see what happens. You will be stopped at the gate. Okay, so you're turned away without any way to to stop that from happening. You don't get put, forced into a fight or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. You will just be okay. turned away at the gates. Um or if you try to get in through various other means like you could climb over walls and stuff. At that mm-hmm. point, if you um fail stealth, someone spots you, then uh you'll just be booted out on your ass. Okay. Can you just do that again, then? You could, but you'll just be booted out okay. of your ass. Almost certainly. Okay. If you get and caught. That means that your progress in the main story will also be blocked, because you won't be able mm. to go see the people that you need to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Think about... Uh, hmm. I mean, there are some games where... Um, like in, in an Elder Scrolls game, mm. like Skyrim, right, where at any point you can draw out a sword and a fireball and start burning and hacking things. Yeah. But you've, there's different pressures to it whether you're in a city or you're on the road and something happens. Mm. If, you, like if you just start doing that in a city, it's like, okay, yeah, the guards will attack you. Yeah. I, mean, um, I guess, I guess, I guess that's open one world on games, stuff like Watch Dogs 2, yeah. um, like yeah. you could totally draw a gun at any point in Grand Theft Auto, someone's going to call the cops on you. There will be consequences mm. for those actions, but you can do them. 
Although in a lot of those games, the consequences are just like, okay, cool, I get a cop chase. Yeah, basically. No, <laughs> Which is good. Like, no the games should be fun. Consequence in that regard. I wonder but if like, in oh, Vegas... It's still a consequence. It's something that happens as a result. You, you, and if you, if you mess up the cop chase, bad things will happen. But it keeps being fun. And that's, that's something you want, right? It's doing something that, def- that defies a sort of norm. It's a choice that leads you down a different path. But if it's a good game, both paths should be fun. There's, okay, so there's if you mess something up in Heavy Rain, it's like be fun. As well, which would be um, yeah. one of the old Infinity games, um, Planescape Torment. Um, okay, I haven't played that. I haven't either. From my understanding okay. of it, though, you like there might be this like social norm and reputation system kind of going on. Fallout New Vegas also might have it, but I'm, I can't quote you. I can't like give you a definite on that because it's been too long since I played Fallout New Vegas. Fair enough. I mean, there are games that have got like karma systems, which will lock or unlock certain content if you're a good or a bad. There's actually like New Vegas but... takes that system from fallout 3 and like goes further with it like there's a specific faction reputation uh specific Mm. towns also have like reputations for you so like if you do side quests in the starting town good springs you will have a good reputation there but you might have a bad reputation with you know the some of the roaming gangs as a result so if you go near them on your way past then they will immediately become aggressive. It's a it's a cool system, um, and it's a bit different to the psychic guards we had in Oblivion. Yeah, no, this is this is uh, this is full like, oh yeah, you have specific reputations, and everybody's going to think of you differently if you have more than just like this good and evil reputation. You can have like. A reputation hmm. that is great in this town, but then really shitty in the next one over. Because, like, mm-hmm. maybe you killed mm-hmm. someone. I mean, it's a good, I mean, it's a good reason to have a shitty <laughs> reputation. If you killed someone, yeah. <laughs> you should probably have a bad reputation. But I'm, I'm, I'm using this as, like, the video game-ass video game example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I kind of struggle to think of stuff where social norms is so, sorry, social norms are actually important just because of how the majority of games are kind of structured. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of a lot of the time there's no like actually it just remind it just reminded me of um there's a comment in I think Saints Row 4 where the big bad says something about how many times have you driven on the footpath just because you thought it'd be a little faster? <laughs> like a lot of games encourage you to, or at least they don't discourage you really from breaking social norms because it's fun to drive on the footpath in a video game. Right. Um, whereas in, um, like in a D and D setting, it's different because you've got a person instead of a computer deciding things. You can, you know, you, a person can react in a lot more different ways. Can take a lot more things into account. So if someone messes up a social norm, you can react in different ways that a game might not have expected. And if you discourage people driving on a footpath in Grand Theft Auto, it wouldn't be as fun anyway. Mm. Well, I mean, you're discouraged by the fact that, like, cops will show up. I guess, but honestly, I do it because I like the cop chases. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's your prerogative. <laughs> but, like, that's good. It's a, it's a consequence. It's a, it, con- like I said, consequences don't have to be bad. They can mm. just be fun. They can be a challenge. Yeah. But yeah, it's always interesting to see how you can I, I wonder raise the if, stakes. Um, Divinity, um, because it's got that GM mode. I wonder if they would allow oh, you yeah, to yeah, do yeah. that sort of thing. That's hmm. That's an exciting prospect. I've got to find out is that, more about that. That's in Divinity Original Sin. Yeah, 2, that's right? in Divinity Original Sin. Is that is that out? I can't remember. It's out I think in it is, early but access. I don't have it. Last I think okay, that. right. Um. I don't think it's... I'd look it up on Steam, but my, the, my desktop computer I, does I'm not handle it up on Steam's Steam. UI. <laughs> okay. Do you want to contextualize it while I do that? Yeah, so we mentioned it a few weeks ago, didn't we? Where um, it's got a um, GM mode where basically you're playing a multiplayer game where one person has set up 
the scenario and the other people are playing in it, but also that person who set up the scenario is still there and can add new stuff to react to it. So it's not just, here's a bunch of pre-programmed things that you can do and the game will know how to react. You're putting a person in there to help the game react and the game just becomes like a uh, an interaction and visualization tool to this story that the person is telling, which is quite neat. So it's the halfway point, mm. I guess, between D&D and a video game. You try to get the best of both worlds to a degree. Yeah, so uh, it is in early access right now uh, with a okay. planned full release on September 14th. That's not too far away. It's not too far away at all. Two and a half months? There's a lot of good stuff coming out in the next few months. Yeah. Oh, man. There's a bunch of, like, mm, the Dishonored DLC I'm really kind of interested in. Um, yeah. Wolfenstein. That's out in August, the uh, sequel. So that's going to be... Oh, man. Those guys know exactly what they're doing, too. Like, <laughs> in this in this political nightmare hellscape that we're all in, they also they gave interviews about the game after, um, after it was announced. And mm-hmm. these are people who know exactly what they're doing by releasing a game <laughs> about brutally murdering many, many Nazis. Uh, in this day and age, I'm sitting in a Nazi America. Yeah, as well. exactly. Like, I'm thrilled. I'm I'm stoked about this game. Um, Hellblade is coming. Oh, no, the, the, ex, the ex, Oh, what's that? Um, it is a game which is about psychosis, actually. Um, right. It's being it's um, by the team who made uh, Devil May Cry or DMC Devil May Cry and Heavenly Sword, and it's about a. Um, I remember Heavenly Sword. That was really good. It's about a Viking, uh, or a, okay. sorry, a Celtic warrior in that era, um, mm-hmm. who's on a quest basically into Viking hell, and it's been collab okay. like. It's being created in collaboration with people who actually experience psychosis. So I'm I'm curious to see how this will all play out and if it's going to be a good game. I got to tell you though, like it looks beautiful right now. Cool. I haven't seen anything about it, so I have to look that up afterwards. Yeah, I will drop you a link to that. Oh, sweet. All right. Um, I think I think that's going to do it for us this week. I think that might be a good point to wrap up on. Oh yeah. So, what are you looking forward to playing then? Uh, I'm looking forward to. I'm going to keep this quick. More time with Nino Kuni. Mm. More time with Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Those games nice. are very good. I'm excited to be spending more time with them. How about you? If you get your computer nice. back. Oh, I want to get my fucking laptop if back. If you get your fucking um, laptop back, what are you playing? I'll be playing Andromeda multiplayer. Uh, Andromeda single player. Mostly Mass Effect single player. I've been I've been too I've been too long out of that and I just I want to get more into it. I want to get further through it. My flatmate finished it ages ago. Uh, I just I want to get more through it. Pl- take more screenshots when I'm doing it as well. Um but yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back into the single player of Mass Effect Andromeda. Nice. Is that all, or if you? Oh yeah, that's going. That's, yeah, you, that's gonna it's going to be like the one thing. I keep forgetting. <laughs> I'm, I'm the thing. one who is playing like a billion things, and you're the one who's playing one. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably still do some multiplayer, um, but it's a single player. I'm really looking forward to getting back into. Thank you very much for listening to the 45th episode of Podcast. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining thank us. Thank you so much for joining us. If you liked what you heard, um, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Um, your support will help us make the best show that we can. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash podcast show. Thank you to Ash Yi for her continuing support of the show. Thank you. Uh, we're a bunch of places. If you're watching this uh, via video, you can see them in the top right. If you're not, we're on Twitter at podcast show. We're on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash podcast show. Uh, we're on email as well. Uh, if you want to send us any fan mail, we're on email. We're on email. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're podcast show at gmail.com. Okay, out of my system. Uh, 
um, this week as well, I have a copy of Deadly Premonition to give away. Um, if you would like to get that, all I, all I ask is that you share the show on Twitter. Um, I'm going to work out a hashtag, and I'll probably edit this in in post and put it in the uh, description of the video. Um, but we'll work out a tag. If you share a link to the show, uh, you'll be entered into a giveaway to receive yourself a copy of Deadly Premonition, the director's cut. Um, nice. What else is going on? Mark, you're online. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm on Twitter at Honest Universe, and I blog as well, though not about video games, at HonestUniverse.com. I am on Twitter as well. You can find me at Cockatiel Cutie, and you can find me as well at Bird.School. You can also find uh, stuff I've been writing. I'm looking at finishing up a, maybe an article or two this week. Um, you can find the stuff I've been writing as well at bit.ly slash birdmedium, one word, uh, no spaces, no capitals. You need a short URL. It's pretty short. It's as short as I can get it. Bit.ly slash bird, bird medium. Bird medium one word. Oh no yeah, you you're still on that shit, huh? <laughs> still on I can't even remember it. You did I know, that I make the same week. joke every fucking week. Every week I'm gonna make that God joke. Goddamn. You're gonna confuse Jokes me. don't get old. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Memes will never die. Um Thank you again for listening to the show. Uh, we have been your hosts. I have to uh, do a thing. There we go. I got music. it going. Music? Yeah, I'm, oh, yeah, music. Thank you to Leon for the use of <laughs> our theme song, Honey Milk Island. SoundCloud.com slash L-E-Y-A-W-N. That's it. See ya.